fighting Mars South Sudan's fifth anniversary of independence. An American entrepreneur discusses doing business in East Africa. And a traditionally tea-drinking nation becomes one of the world's fastest-growing coffee markets. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Now, South Sudan has had a bumpy road since becoming an independent nation. The country has been racked by violence and renewed fighting between opposing army forces has raised fears of a return to civil war. Over the weekend, the country marked its fifth anniversary while panicked residents sheltered inside their homes. At least 275 people have been killed since Thursday. Viewers, Sladit Sahok has more on the latest round of sectarian violence. President Salva Kiir and his rival, First Vice President Riek Machar, appeared together in a show Solidarity on Friday, the eve of the anniversary of independence, but heavy gunfire went on unabated. There is nothing to be done about it, but we have to continue finding a solution to it. Mashar returned to Juba in April, which was seen as a step to end the fighting. But deadly clashes broke out late Thursday and went on while Kir and Mashar were meeting in an effort to defuse tensions. This is an interruption to the good process which we have initiated. The continued fighting raises a question of whether the president and his deputy can control their respective forces. We would note that the, that the senior leadership there uh, in Juba were, were in a meeting as the clashes started. Uh, those leaders have assured us of their commitment to resolve the tensions that have escalated in, in recent days. South Sudan spiraled into a civil war after the president, an ethnic Dinka, dismissed his first vice president, an ethnic Noor, in December of 2013. The peace agreement reached in August of last year, which reinstated Mashar, has not made a difference. Despite the peace agreement that formally ended the civil war in August uh, last year, the conflict and instability has spread um, to previously unaffected areas, and this is what is really of concern. The United Nations says none of the two and a half million people displaced by violence in the past three years have yet been able to return home. Meanwhile, more people are getting displaced. Even the UN compounds and civilian protection sites in Juba have been caught in the crossfire in the past few days, prompting an angry response from UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who called on Kir and Mashar to de-escalate hostilities. The UN Security Council on Sunday condemned the violence in strong Longest terms. The Security Council members stressed that attacks against civilians and UN premises and personnel may constitute war crimes. Council members also are considering boosting the international peacekeeping forces in the country. Zlatica Hope, VOA News, Washington. A short time ago at the United Nations, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon spoke about the fighting in South Sudan. The renewed fighting is outrageous. It is yet another grievous setback. It deepens the country's suffering. It makes a mockery of commitments to peace. Many people have been killed in heavy fighting. There are growing fears that many more could die in another round of violence. Well, joining us now from the United Nations in New York, VOA's Margaret Bashir. Margaret, uh, please uh, tell us more. Hi, yes, Margaret, tell us more about this possibility of uh, an arms embargo and targeted sanctions on some of South Sudan's leaders. Right. Well, as you can see, the Secretary General very angry today at uh, Riyak Mashar and Sal Vakir. He, he has been repeatedly frustrated by these two leaders, and uh, I think it's, it's really showing. His peacekeeping chief last year was calling for an arms embargo. Uh, the council didn't move. You know, the Chinese, the Russians, the, some of the other council members have been reluctant to uh, enact an arms embargo. But I think, uh, you know, having it come from the secretary general himself, it will have a bit more weight. And uh, with the situation the way it is, the U.N. just can't afford to have yet another crisis uh, escalating in the world. I mean, there's just so many crises right now, and the U.N. is really trying to keep up. So they do not want to see South Sudan unravel.
Uh, talk about an arms embargo. I mean, these gentlemen who have two armies in the same town, they already have arms. So how effective does this become, especially when there is already a conflict on the ground? Well, it's difficult to say, but if, it, if they can impose an arms embargo, it would limit new weapons coming to them, more sophisticated weapons perhaps coming to them, as well as ammunition. So if they run out of ammunition and there's no more ammunition coming in, then maybe the guns fall silent. But, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that the council is going to adopt this measure. The secretary general also urged targeted sanctions against leaders and commanders. And uh, so he's, he's really uh, quite frustrated. He also wants to see the force boosted, uh, UNMIS, which has about 12,000 peacekeepers, 1,200 police. Uh, the Security Council said last night that is something they are considering. But, you know, as usual, the problem is getting them there quickly. Uh, they've asked regional countries to prepare to send troops. Uh, EGAD, perhaps, or the African Union might be able to step in and send uh, troops quickly. Otherwise, the UN might have to tap its other missions in the region, perhaps in, uh, in uh, DRC. So we'll, we'll just have to see how fast they can get the troops there, because it's not a quick process if they're doing it from New York. Now, talk about the arms embargo. Who is opposed to an arms embargo and why? Well, I think traditionally in the council, it's been the Chinese who have big investments in uh, South Sudan. It's been the Russians who generally oppose arms embargoes. Uh, I'm not sure where Egypt stands on South Sudan in particular, but they've also sort of been against sanctions and, and actions against some countries uh, in the past. So we'll have to see. I would think it's countries that sell arms to South Sudan that might be against it. They don't want to see their, their commerce affected. But uh, the people are dying there. It's getting out of control. It's it been since December 2013 now. It is frustrating. Margaret, thank you very much for joining us. And today. it's a huge humanitarian crisis. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. That's uh, VOA's UN uh, uh, correspondent, uh, Margaret Bashir, reporting live uh, from New York. Now, for more perspective on the fighting in South Sudan, joining me in the studio is Majak Agut. He's a former South Sudan deputy defense minister and a former political detainee, Mr. A good welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Now, everybody around the world is saying, what's wrong with the South Sudanese leaders? What's happening? Well, uh, two important dimensions could, um, could, could be unearthed in trying to answer this question. First of all uh, is the uh, uh, proclivity of the two leaders to arson. I'm sorry to say that, mm -hmm. but uh, this is what it has come to. Mm -hmm. Uh, and secondly is, uh, is, is, uh, is the nature of uh, the permanent ceasefire arrangements uh, architecture uh, which uh, put uh, the same armies in the same location in Juba together. Our position initially was uh, to have Juba demilitarized. This is what we put on the table in Addis. And we had also called for a third party force to be present in Juba to provide... We, we, we which seems to make sense because, uh, you know, you wonder, can you really have peace in a country where you have two men controlling armies with uh, artillery, heavy weaponry, even in the long term? Can you really see a, pos a possibility of peace? Unfortunately, that's the nature of politics in South Sudan. Uh, uh, politics and, uh, and, uh, and, and warlord entrepreneurship are, yeah. uh, are interlaced. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, not, not very many politicians who matter today yeah. would be what they are if they didn't command military forces. And now each of them says, oh, we want peace. But the, the armies are fighting. Who is giving the orders? Do they, are they in control? Of well, the two, men, the two men on the 7th uh, came out and told the world that they, they were not in control. They didn't know what was taking place in their immediate surrounding, you know, within, outside the walls of the palace. So it tells uh, uh, you very clearly that whether, whether the two men uh, could be trusted yeah. even to run the affairs of the nation if they cannot really. Uh, take charge of controlling their, uh, their immediate bodyguards. Yes. Now, so the question becomes, uh, if, if this peace arrangement doesn't seem to be working, what is the hope for South Sudan? Well, there is still uh, uh, a lot of uh, promise out there for South Sudan. Uh, the, 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 the country is now stuck with these two leaders. Mm -hmm. 
the, 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 uh, the main uh, obstacle to, to the progress and the future of South Sudan. And uh, given the risky behavior and the way they are running the affairs of the nation, uh, it is actually time to call for uh, their departure from power because uh, what do they deliver? It mm -hmm. is uh, what I said uh, in, uh, from, uh, from the onset, uh, their predisposition to arson, you know, to set the country alight. This is the only thing they have delivered, nothing else. Yes. And, and you know, that for the many who are observing every day, their hearts bleed for the citizens. There were women, children who are dying and ha trying to get out of town. And now, what, what, what can somebody tell the citizens who waited for so long for a peaceful country? It is, it is a tragedy, and uh, uh, all of us are ashamed yeah. of uh, what has become the outcome of our independence. Uh, the only uh, hope is that this is not going to last forever. Uh, leaders are, uh, are transient, they come and go, and if the leadership uh, or this generation has failed to deliver the, uh, the promise uh, for, for, for the struggle, another generation of leaders is going to do that. Is there a danger of um, uh, different factions, uh, perhaps in you know one of these days, clamoring for secession, given now that it seems like the different ethnic groups cannot coexist? I think the the direction that the things should take in South Sudan at the moment is uh, for any serious political uh, leader or any aspirant. Yeah. To, to pursue a non-violent approach. Okay. And, and I think that's where we, we're applying weapons and arms against ourselves has proven to be very, very dangerous and nobody is benefiting from that at all. Indeed, embarrassing, frustrating, and painful. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today and for your perspectives. You. Uh, that's uh, um, uh, Majak Agut. He's a former South Sudan Deputy Defense Minister and a former political detainee. Now, South Sudan authorities, or rather South African authorities, say they have arrested and charged twin brothers with conspiring to blow up a U.S. mission and various Jewish institutions in South Africa. Police announced Monday that uh, Bradley Lee Tulsi, Tony Lee Tulsi, and two other people who are yet to be charged were arrested in Johannesburg on Saturday. The four were arrested before boarding a flight to Syria and had been under surveillance for nearly a year. Officials say the brothers may have links to the Islamic State group. Now, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has uh, warned that political uncertainty over the Democratic Republic of Congo's next presidential election could spiral into a severe crisis. He recently said UN peacekeepers are developing contingency plans for widespread violence. The U.S. Special Envoy for the Great Lakes region of Africa, Thomas Periello, told VOA the U.S. will support all efforts aimed at ensuring a peaceful election in the DRC. Well, we're strongly supportive of uh, the African Union efforts under Adam Kojo and, a, and an expanded international team to try to bring all the key leaders together for a negotiated solution forward. Uh, we do worry that if we get to December 19th uh, without a consensus path forward, uh, that that could be uh, um, a very challenging moment for DRC. But there is time left uh, to figure out a way forward uh, that, that can bring all those sides together within the, the uh, spirit and, and context of the Constitution. So what I what I found the uh, people most want of the Congolese uh, the, with whom we speak regularly on all sides of the political spectrum uh, is to allow those elections to proceed. The United States does not support a candidate. We do not support a party. We simply support the Congolese people's right uh, to determine their next leader. Uh, Pirello has departed on a planned trip to Africa and France that includes stops in the Republic of Congo, Tanzania, Egypt, Angola and Paris. Well, U.S. President Barack Obama has condemned violence as a means to effect change after the shooting deaths of five police officers in Dallas, Texas. While tensions between minority communities and law enforcement are, on, are not new, uh, the slaughter of police officers has shocked the nation and further complicated an already sensitive dialogue about public safety in America. VOA's Michael Bowman reports. Anguish and sorrow blanket Dallas, while anger still simmers in Minnesota and Louisiana after last week's fatal shooting of black men by local law enforcement. President Obama weighed in from Spain. Any violence directed at police officers is a reprehensible crime, 
and needs to be prosecuted. Initial investigations suggest the Dallas shooter may have been plotting even larger attacks against police as retribution for what some see as persistent violence targeting racial minorities. U.S. officials say vigilantism cannot be tolerated. Violence is never the answer. An eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. Now's the time for healing, the time for mourning, and the time for building bridges and dialogue. We will make America safe again. The horrific turn of events reverberated on the presidential campaign trail. A brutal attack on our police force is an attack on our country and an attack on our families. We must stand in solidarity with law enforcement, which we must remember is the force between civilization and total chaos. We cannot, we must not vilify police officers. White Americans need to do a better job of listening. When African Americans talk, talk about the seen and unseen barriers you face every day. If getting people to listen is the goal, the president has a suggestion on how best to deliver the message. Maintaining uh, a, a, a truthful and serious and respectful tone is going to help mobilize American society to bring about real change. And that is our ultimate objective. For now, emotions run high in Dallas and beyond. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories you covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out all headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up. American investors eye business possibilities in East Africa. Stay with us. This is BizBeat. Baby products are booming in China and buyers are eyeing goods from overseas available online. Some 30 million Chinese purchased baby products from foreign websites such as Amazon and Drugstore.com in 2015. Nia Wei has two baby daughters. She says foreign products bought from overseas are generally more attractive than those made in China in terms of selection and price. Lia Nan is taking advantage of this trend, opening her own online baby store, Mia.com. Uh, nowadays, the Chinese young mom is learning the Western way to raise their baby, so they actually need the Western products to support their raising philosophy. China's one-child law was rescinded late last year, and some two million more Chinese babies are expected to be born this year, giving online retailers a growing market, literally. For VOA's BizBeat, I'm Philip Alexio. Welcome back. Here in Washington, the Forum for Doing Business with East Africa is underway. For more details, here's Africa 54's Ashton Gidu Yuwot. This conference will unite business partners from Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda and Tanzania, as well as American investors. Joining me now to tell us more about this business forum is David Saunders, the moderator of the conference. Mr. Saunders, welcome to Africa 54. Welcome again. So what should the East African businesses expect from this forum? Well, we, we want the American consumer market, business market, to learn more about the potential opportunities for business and trade in East Africa. So this is an opportunity for the East African business leaders to, to inform the American business community why it is a great idea to do business in East Africa. So, David, you've done business with Africa for a long time, yes. but uh, can you briefly give us an outline of the core factors that impact the viability of doing business within these four East African countries? Well, first of all, it's, it's very important to have English-speaking language. It's the predominant language in East Africa, which is very good for the American cons business community, infrastructure development, and also ICT, and good access to financing. Those are the very important core factors. 
So what are the, the kind of you know, business climate that American investors are really looking forward to if they have to invest in those countries? Agriculture particularly is 80% of the um, population is involved in the agricultural sector, either agriculture or either trade with Africa, agriculture. We also have uh, infrastructure development, uh, building construction, and ICT. You mentioned ICT, but uh, is that an issue? Because uh, in some countries you have slower internet, the internet providers sometimes are not reliable, power sometimes, electricity, so to speak, is not reliable. Is that a concern for the investors? Not in East Africa. Recently, Kenya has established a state-of-the-art fiber optic network that covers the entire region of, of East Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, when you look at these four countries, they are members of AGOA. Is that an, incent an incentive when Americans are looking forward to going to Africa, for that matter? Yes, uh, it's a tremendous incentive because the American business community realizes that there are certain parameters and certain policies in place to ensure that they can have good trade relationships with East Africa. And uh, at this forum coming up uh, next week, do we expect uh, African businesses, East African businesses to showcase what they have or what they're looking for in American investors? What kind of, you know? Yes, we will have um, representatives from the African embassies there as well as some of the business community mm -hmm. from East Africa to meet with the um, participants of the program so they can learn about East Africa directly from people who are interested in doing business with them. There's, sometimes we ha you have some kind of laws that uh, make countries you know, sign certain uh, you know, trade investment uh, cooperation with American uh, investors. Do we have that in those countries, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania and Ethiopia? Uh, under the Africa Growth, Growth and Opportunity Act, that is the primary trade legislation we want you to work with. Mm -hmm. But you also have various programs, uh, OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, as well as MEGA, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Association. Those programs here in the U.S. help American businesses be successful in doing business in East Africa. Maybe briefly, can you tell me some of those investors that are coming to this forum, what really do they want to do? Are they looking for IC, I, ICT businesses or are they looking into just agricultural businesses? Are there others that uh, they are looking forward to doing, like tourism, because you're in tourism business especially? Well, they're, look, they're looking for <laughs> trade partners. They're really looking for the East African government to say, come to East Africa mm -hmm. to do business with us. That's what they really need to get is an encouragement to come to East Africa. And we've seen such forums before. But do we know, do we see the fruits of that? Because we've seen all this partnership before in many years, mm -hmm. a, a few years ago we've had similar forums. Mm -hmm. Have we seen tangible results? Yes. Um, East Africa has been very, very um, involved in trade engagements with American communities. There's many more focused business trade missions to East Africa now since AGOA has been renewed. Thank you so much, David. David Saunders is the moderator of the East Africa Business Forum. David, thank you for setting the scene for us. And Vincent, back to you. Well, thank you very much. And it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, China's coffee market gets a boost in Beijing. We'll be right back. conflict to an end. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Something's brewing in Beijing. For a caffeine-related boost, there is no better place to come than here, the fourth cafe show China in Beijing. According to the International Coffee Organization, in 2013 to 2014, China saw a total of 1.4 million bags of coffee imported. 
Uh, that's quite an increase from 418,000 nine years ago. Over the past few decades, China's middle class has been rising rapidly, overtaking the U.S. as the largest, according to a 2015 report from Credit Suzy. Entrepreneurs believe increasing disposable income, disposable income could lead to more urbanized drinking coffee, especially younger generations. Well, next up, a team in Israel have unearthed an ancient cemetery, which they say will unravel the mystery of the Philistines. Now they're performing a DNA and other tests on bone samples found at the cemetery, uh, dating to the 11th to 8th centuries BC, uh, to help resolve a debate about the Philistines' geographical origins. In the Bible, the Philistines are depicted as the ancient Israelites' arch enemy, a foreign people who migrated from, from lands to the west and settled in five main cities in today's southern Israel and the Gaza Strip. Archaeologists have long believed the Philistines came from the Aegean region. One thing we do know, the Philistines were normal size with no evidence of any Goliath-sized giants. Well, and finally, the European Space Agency is using the isolated Arctic landscape of Antarctica to mimic the experience of astronauts living or traveling in space. In the frozen sub-zero temperatures of the bleak landscape, the air is too thin to breathe and winter brings months of darkness. Temperatures can drop to minus 80 degrees Celsius during winter. The yearly average temperature is minus 50 degrees Celsius. No animals can survive in the region. Even bacteria finds it hard coping with the extreme temperatures. The ESA teamed up with the British Antarctic Survey to study how humans survive conditions which resemble long duration space flights or living on the moon or Mars. And that is what is trending today. Now, tennis took center stage in, the, in London this weekend and set a court at Wimbledon on Sunday, Scotland's Andy Murray won his second Wimbledon ta uh, tennis title, defeating Canada's Milos Raonic in three sets. This is Murray's third Grand Slam title. He won at Wimbledon in 2013. Murray had lost his last three Grand Slam title matches before this one. And American Serena Williams has done it again. She won her seventh Wimbledon singles championship, try tying a German Steffi Graf for the most ever open era major titles the world's number one ranked player serena beat german angelica kerber for her 22nd grand slam singles crown well that's our show for today now be sure to watch africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com for more news tune in to voa's evening radio show africa news tonight at 18 under utc on in the mornings today break africa that is between 0 300 and 0 600 utc monday through friday thanks for watching from all of us in washington have a good night. I'm Vincent McCory from Africa 54. This is VOA. Follow us on Africa 54. Go to facebook.com slash VOA Africa 54.